So good afternoon, everybody. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to the 2015 Singapore Symposium in Legal Theory, and a particular pleasure to be introducing uh, Fred Shah as our first speaker this year. Fred is the David and Mary Harrison Distinguished Professor of Law at the University of Virginia, and also Frank Stanton Professor of the First Amendment at Harvard Emeritus. He's at the peak of his illustrious academic career, which has included a stint as Eastman Professor at Oxford, amongst many other visiting appointments. He originally made a living out of smut, his words, uh, litigating uh, in the area of free speech and obscenity, but decided his talents were best suited to an academic career. His first book, The Law of Obscenity, in 1976, was followed by many other books that have opened up fields. And unlike a number of us academics who like to find an area where we command some respect and can maintain that credibility throughout our careers, Fred's career has been illustrious in a number of ways by opening up different fields. So the law of obscenity in 1976 was followed by free speech, 82, playing by the rules, 91, profiles, probabilities and stereotypes in 2003, thinking like a lawyer, 2009, and about to be published, uh, the book whose themes he will be developing in his presentation today, The Force of Law in 2015. Fred, it's a pleasure to have you with us, and I'm very interested to hear what you've got to have to say. So, thank you very much um, for inviting me here. Uh, I've been in Singapore twice before, but not in the last 10 or 11 years, so it's uh, uh, wonderful to be back, and my Two previous visits have been in connection with the School of Public Policy, so it's uh, especially good uh, to be doing something in the law faculty. Um, I should uh, preface what I am going to say um, by blaming Andrew for a, at least a good part of what I'm going to talk about. Uh, my preference would have been to do something cruder rougher um, on work that has not yet happened. Andrew wanted me to talk about coercion and force in law, so at least part of what I am going to talk about, uh, and as I said, I blame him, um, is work that will be coming out in a few weeks uh, in this book, but at least for me, um, the book is a midpoint uh, or way station in a larger agenda, so I will talk a little bit about what's already in it uh, or what I've already argued, but in a number of ways, it's the beginning of a longer and larger agenda, so I welcome your comments, questions, reactions, personal abuse, insults, um, whatever you uh, find appropriate. So there are actually, um, in my thinking about law and force and coercion, two different agendas. One is an agenda related to the methodology of jurisprudence or the methodology of the philosophy of law. I don't distinguish between the two. Um, and the second is an agenda uh, more substantive about the importance of force, sanctions, coercions, threats, uh, and the like to understanding what it is that's important about law. So. Let me start with the methodological um, part. And appropriately, since as I understand it, he was sitting in this seat roughly a year ago, I want to start with Joseph Raz. Uh, uh, he is my uh, foil or target or whatever the appropriate um, word would be. Um, so Raz in a number of different articles about 
uh, legal theory and about the possibility or not of there being a, a theory of law uh, has said, and I quote exactly, the sociology of law provides a wealth of detailed information and analysis of the functions of law in some particular societies. Legal philosophy has to be content with those few features which all legal systems necessarily possess. You have to know Raz to uh, fully appreciate the contempt that surrounded the first part of that quote. Uh, if he were saying it uh, here and live, you would see the expression on his face when he talked about the sociology of law. Uh, but I'm more interested in his claim that legal philosophy has to be content with those few features which all legal systems necessarily possess. Um, so um, this is a claim in part about philosophy or a claim about legal philosophy. It is a claim in which Raz is not alone. Um, Scott Shapiro in his book Legality uh, starts with a similar understanding of the nature of jurisprudence. Julie Dixon in her book, an important book, uh, almost entirely devo devoted to jurisprudential methodology, makes similar kinds of claims. And in philosophy itself, uh, apart from legal philosophy, we see similar ideas emerging in the work of some number of people, perhaps most prominently Frank Jackson and Colin McGinn. Um, so for all of these people, um, philosophy is at its heart, non-empirical conceptual analysis. Uh, we could talk about what empirical means in that claim, but largely non-empirical conceptual analysis. And that conceptual analysis itself is the search for the necessary and sufficient conditions um, of some um, particular uh, concept or some particular um, idea. Now, um, implicit in that claim is that concepts have essences, that concepts have necessary or essential properties, uh, and the uh, chief proponents of this form of conceptual analysis uh, are insistent on that claim, which is why Raz is able to say that legal philosophy, for him a branch of general philosophy, has to be consent, content with those few features which all legal systems necessarily possess if they are to, be, if they are to count as legal systems at all. Let's call this view, for want of a better term, essentialism, the view that our concepts, uh, our categories of the world, uh, the, our understanding of the world is through concepts and categories that have essences. That, it turns out, is deeply contested. So um, if you want to look for the other side of this claim, there are various different philosophical traditions um, that one could identify as existing on the other side. The most well-known, the most important, but probably the most controversial uh, is the later Wittgenstein. Uh, I say most controversial because there are certainly some number of philosophers uh, who, once you refer to Wittgenstein, take the position that nothing else that you have to say is worth listening to. Uh, and there are others who take the position uh, that Wittgenstein said virtually everything worth saying. Uh, the truth for me is somewhere in between, but Wittgenstein's view um, about uh, family resemblance, the idea uh, that at least many of our concepts, and depending on how you interpret him, possibly all of our concepts and all of our language, uh, but at least uh, many or most, um, do not have necessary or essential properties at all. Uh, and one of his many metaphors uh, is that 
the properties of some concept, the one he's most famous for using as an example, is games are like the strands of a rope and not the links of a chain. Uh, none of them are essential. But one finds, in fact, that the same non-essentialist ideas recur in various other, uh, from various other philosophical directions. So um, Max Black um, in the 1940s and 1950s, and then somewhat later and somewhat more prominently, John Searle have talked about cluster concepts very similar to what Wittgenstein was talking about in terms of family resemblance, um, that our concepts involve clusters of properties and that no one of those properties, uh, none of those properties is individually essential or necessary. Um, one of the things that's interesting about the Wittgensteinian claim uh, or the Black's Searle claim is that it turns out to fit remarkably well with what uh, modern and not so modern cognitive scientists, most prominently Eleanor Roche and her students and successors, have said about how people actually think. Uh, that is, that if we look at the cognitive science of concept use, the cognitive science of how we understand the world, it turns out, at least according to the cognitive scientists, that it resembles the family resemblance kind of claim, the co cluster concept kind of claim, some dimensions of the prototype kind of claim, uh, much more than the view that there are essential or necessary properties. More recently, or most recently, um, a Princeton philosopher, Sarah Jane Leslie, has been developing the idea uh, of generics, which again um, bears a similarity to the same non-essentialist category of views. Uh, I have considerable sympathy with the idea of generics. I've written a little bit about generics myself uh, in slightly different language. Uh, the idea is simple, that in our language, we commonly use terms, we commonly use generalizations that are resistant to counter examples. So if I make the claim, Volvos are reliable, and you say, I once had an unreliable Volvo, so you are wrong. You do not, at least to me, understand the way in which generalizations exist in our language. Uh, Volvos uh, are reliable, Swiss cheese has holes, mathematicians are clever, pit bulls are dangerous. Uh, all of these are claims that are resistant to isolated um, counterexamples. Now, if this were a talk about uh, generics, we could get into just what degree of prevalence is necessary for something to be a generic. It doesn't have to be a majority. Uh, it, rather, uh, to make a generic claim is to say that some property is present in uh, something that we are talking about in some concept or some word more than it is in some background or baseline word or concept. So, for example, when I say that pit bull dogs are dangerous, I need not be claiming that the majority of them I'm certainly not claiming that all of them are dangerous. I need not be claiming that the majority of them are dangerous. I am merely claiming that the category of pit bull, dog, pit bull dogs is more dangerous than the category of dogs in general, or than the category of various other breeds. Uh, so again, um, if we were to 
look at cars and think about unreliable cars rather than reliable ones. Uh, if, we, if I were to say to take a couple of notoriously unreliable cars of the past, that Yugos are unreliable or Trabants uh, are unreliable, it is not necessarily to say that all of them, it is certainly not to say that all of them are reliable, it is not to say that a majority of them are unreliable, it is to to say that the category of Yugos or Trabants is unreliable compared to the implicit category of cars. I spend a little bit more time on this because the idea of generics appeals to me um, for various reasons, uh, perhaps partly because it relates to the idea of rules more than some of these others, but I mention it just because it is among uh, the Wittgensteinian family resemblance claim, the cluster concept claim, the cognitive science claim, one still one more version of non-essentialism or anti-essentialism. Indeed, it may be that anti-essentialism is, um, even in jurisprudence, more well-established than we might think. If you read the first chapter of H.L.A. Hart's The Concept of Law, without reading the rest of the book, you will come away with the conclusion that Hart himself was an anti-essentialist. Chapter one, um, written um, in its basic form early on, and written when Hart was most friendly with and most under the influence of J.L. Austin, a premier anti-essentialist, uh, has strong anti-essentialist claims, and Hart says towards the end of chapter one that it may even be that law itself uh, is a family resemblance rather than having essential properties. That claim gets progressively weakened over the rest uh, of the concept of law to the extent that it is more or less entirely abandoned in the postscript. Um, but at least in chapter one, one can find the same kind of uh, anti-essentialism. I don't want to resolve this debate. One of the reasons I don't want to resolve this debate is that I am not a philosopher of language. Uh, that's in part because I am not a philosopher at all. Um, but uh, I am not a philosopher of language. I am not a um, philosopher of mind. I am not a philosopher uh, of any variety. I just want to identify the fact that the, that the implicit basis of Raz's claim is deeply contested within philosophy. So when Raz says legal philosophy is such and such, he is staking out one side of a debate uh, rather than making a claim that all philosophers uh, would agree to. Having identified the fact that this is deeply contested, I want to leave it in a way behind. Uh, it is a preface to, at least for me, the methodological claim that to do legal theory, to do jurisprudence, to do philosophy of law can, not necessarily, but can involve the search for and the examination of those properties that are typical of law rather than essential or necessary to it. Indeed, the only reason for everything that I've said up to now is just to uh, put in the proper perspective or the proper context uh, the claim of Raz and Shapiro and Dixon uh, and some number of others that if you are not looking for essential properties, you are not doing jurisprudence, you are not doing legal philosophy, you, uh, and so on. I want to resist as a matter of the sociology of jurisprudence or disciplinary sociology, I want to resist that claim and therefore be, ab uh, be able to make the claim that the examination of those properties which are typical of law but not necess necessary uh, to the concept of law in all possible legal systems in all possible worlds are appropriately part of the jurisprudential enterprise. Uh, now, um, we might, uh, to use an example of this, um, uh, we might think about birds. Uh, flying is not an essential property of birds. Birds are feathered vertebrates. 
Uh, some feathered vertebrates, some birds do not fly. Uh, penguins, for example, or ostriches. And there are things that fly, even animals that fly, that are not birds. Bats, for example. Um, bats are pretty much the, um, uh, as well as um, insects, of course, and some number of others, uh, not flying squirrels, which are gliders and not flyers, in case anybody cares. Uh, similarly, flying fish are not flyers. They are also gliders, uh, but we can safely leave that aside. The basic idea here um, is that um, flying is not necessary to birdness. But if we want to understand birds as a category, it would be very surprising to talk about birds, to write a book about birds, to try to understand the world of birds without ever mentioning flying. That, to me, is uh, the role that coercion plays with respect to law. So with all of that as a um, preface, um, that uh, to the idea that legal theory um, or, the, or an examination of the nature of law uh, can and should look at those properties that are typical, even if not necessary to law. For me, one of those, not the only one, but one of those uh, is coercion, force, sanctions, threats, uh, and this category of um, uh, behaviors uh, or phenomena. Now, a bit of history. Um, so the history here starts with Bentham. Uh, Bentham, uh, for me, is an intriguing character. Bentham is one of the world's great haters. Uh, and one of, the th one of the many things that Bentham hated um, was law. Uh, or more accurately, the legal system that he knew best. Uh, Bentham's father was a lawyer. Bentham himself was trained in law. Um, but uh, it's hard to fully capture uh, the degree to which Bentham despised the English legal system, despised the common law, uh, and wanted to reform it dramatically. Indeed, one of Bentham's more interesting claims um, is the argument that it ought to be illegal to give legal advice for money. Now, we might think that Bentham was joking, but from everything we know about Bentham, he never joked. Um, his view um, was that uh, if it were illegal to give legal advice for money, uh, that would create the appropriate incentives for Parliament to write clear understandable uh, understandable by ordinary citizens law that would not need except in the very rare case the intervention of either judges or lawyers uh, so uh, Bentham in, intriguingly although clearly a product of an, a, uh, a common law system is probably our purest civil law theorist uh, that Bentham's view about codification, Bentham's view um, about the uh, importance of codes, the importance of clear and comprehensive codes, and the problems uh, with common law go well beyond anything you find in anyone who actually lived uh, and operated in a civil law country. So for Bentham, because his agenda of reform was so dramatic, he wanted to destroy the legal system that he knew and start over again. It was important for him to understand law and to understand the legal system and to understand a deeply defective legal system in entirely descriptive terms. And that led him to want to understand law largely or substantially in terms of force and coercion and threats. That is, if the system were so um, poorly designed, why would people follow it? Uh, 
except for reasons of force, coercion, threats, sanctions, and so on. So we find a fair amount of this uh, and this understanding of the idea of law uh, in Bentham's writings about law, but the most significant of them now published uh, under the title of On the Penal Branch of Jurisprudence, was largely lost uh, until the 1940s. Bentham wrote it originally um, to be part in the 1780s uh, to be part of the principles of morals and legislation. Uh, it was uh, undiscovered until the 1940s, and one consequence of that is that we know of Bentham's ideas largely through his disciple and friend John Austin. Uh, Austin, uh, even more than Bentham, put force and coercions and the threats of evil the threats of punishment at the center of his understanding of the idea of law and the center of the idea of legal obligation. Um, Austin, who was uh, interested in, uh, or more accurately, obsessed with definition, categorization, and typology, um, was himself a, an essentialist of sorts, and for him, coercion and force and threats of evil were essential to law, uh, that without the threat, um, an individual law was not a law at all. Without the ability to issue threats, a legal system was not a genuine legal system uh, at all. So uh, in Austin's definition of law, one finds sanctions and force and the threat uh, of evil. So now we jump forward uh, to the 1930s. People began to recognize, even though for uh, more or less a um, hundred years, Austin had been the leading figure in the English language analytic jurisprudential tradition. If you studied jurisprudence in the English language uh, from the uh, 1840s, um, on, uh, you studied Austin, you learned your Austin, you read Austin, you argued about Austin. Austin was the central figure. In the late 1930s and the 1940s, the American Roscoe Pound um, started writing a little bit about Austin and started um, observing uh, and claiming that the Austinian picture of law was woefully incomplete. That is, there were numerous dimensions of law, Pound argued, that could not be understood in terms of force and threats. Contracts, wills, the rules of procedure, and much, much else uh, to Pound um, could not be understood in terms of threats partly because although the law tells us how to make a will or make a contract or form a corporation, it doesn't tell us uh, that we have to do so, whether in fact to uh, create a will uh, or create a corporation is entirely up to us. And for Pound, this did not seem coercive or threatening um, at all. Law merely facilitated or made it possible to engage in these kinds of transactions, but didn't coerce anybody into doing anything. What I've just talked about is most familiar, um, not from Pound, whose writings on this have been largely forgotten, but more from Hart himself. Uh, so um, most of the beginning of Hart's concept of law uh, is based on the same idea. Austin is his foil. Um, Hart develops an idea also associated with the same John Searle that I mentioned earlier, but Hart may be earlier here. Uh, as early as Hart's inaugural lecture, he talked about uh, the way in which law, to use Searle's terms, had a constitutive as well as a regulative dimension. That is, um, when law uh, creates the very idea of a corporation, 
it is constituting something that without law and without legal rules could not exist. It's why Hart uses the example uh, of games. Um, without uh, the rules of cricket or baseball, there, are no, there would be no such thing as a run in that sense. Without the uh, rules of football, there would be no goals in that sense. Um, without the rules um, of um, contract bridge or baseball, there would be no grand slams. Uh, games, law like games, uh, creates the possibility of engaging in certain forms of behavior. It's what Searle talks about in terms of the distinction between regulative rules and constitutive rules. Hart probably had the idea somewhat earlier, as early as the 1950s, but uh, Hart used is this idea to, uh, again, argue that none of this looks coercive. None of this involves threats. None of this involves force. Uh, and therefore, for Hart, Austin was mistaken to put threats and force so much at the center of the idea of law. Later on in the concept Hart does say that coercion is a natural necessity for a law. And if we combine um, Hart's claim that it is a natural necessity for law but not essential to law with the essentialist turn that has followed Hart, even if we don't find it in uh, very much in Hart itself, uh, it turns out that the idea of coercion has largely been left behind in the jurisprudential literature. I don't want to overstate the case. I don't want to overstate my own uh, originality. Over the last few years, uh, a number of others have begun to try to bring force and coercion back into thinking about what's important about law. Uh, Matthew Kramer does so. Um, Grant Lamont does so. There are a few others, but by and large, um, if one follows the Roz, Dixon, Shapiro, et al. methodological line, then one comes to the conclusion that if Pound and Hart are right and coercion is not essential to law, that there are things that we understand to be law but that are not coercive in any normal or natural sense of coercion, then coercion drops out of the jurisprudential agenda. That, it strikes me, is wrong. So let me switch gears for uh, a moment or shift the terrain for a moment and talk about coercion more directly and why coercion is indeed important. So we start, or I start, um, with a very long-standing literature on obedience to law. I say very long standing because, after all, it starts with Socrates. Socrates, importantly, um, uh, when uh, sentenced to death for corrupting the youth of Athens, took the position that his um, uh, punishment or his conviction was unjust and it was wrong. And when his friends came to him the night before his execution and said, we agree with you, Socrates, your conviction, um, uh, the judgment is unjust. We can get you out of here. There is a ship now waiting. When Socrates says no, uh, he says no uh, because he believes that he has an obligation to obey the law just because it is the law a content independent obligation to obey the law just because it is law. That started a very long tradition. It includes Locke and Hobbes and others in the social contract tradition. It includes John Rawls and people who find the obligation to obey the law uh, in the idea of fair play or reciprocity. Uh, it includes Gerald Postma, Postuma, who finds even more recently the obligation to obey the law just because it is the law um, in uh, game theory and in 
in coordination and cooperation and the way in which law can solve prisoners' dilemma problems or less uh, formal coordination uh, uh, or cooperation problems. And on the other side of this, although somewhat more recently, uh, is the tradition that now tends to go by the name of philosophical anarchism. Philosophical anarchism, um, perhaps an inappropriate term. When I think of anarchists, uh, I think of creepy little people uh, in uh, black clothing, surreptitiously uh, putting bombs under gov government buildings in the middle of the night. Um, uh, I actually had a grandfather who had some sympathy with those people, uh, but uh, that's neither here nor there. Philosophical anarchism is the view that Socrates, Rawls, Postuma, uh, Locke, Hobbes, and many others are wrong, and the fact of being something law the fact of something being law uh, adds nothing to the obligations whatsoever. Uh, my colleague John Simmons is probably the most prominent modern day uh, philosophical anarchist, but one can find uh, even earlier important work uh, by M.B.E. Smith in a 1971 article in the Yale Law Journal uh, established the idea um, that Yes, it is, there is a moral obligation to do the morally right thing, but once one has engaged in the appropriate calculations, once one has decided what the morally right thing to do is, uh, the fact that law says don't do it, uh, or even the fact that law says do do it, adds nothing to the calculation. The fact of law uh, is morally irrelevant. Uh, there is no moral obligation to obey the law just because it is the law. That's an interesting debate. What interests me is less that normative debate, but the empirical side of the same debate. That is, do people obey the law just because it is the law? If you look superficially at the existing literature, you will come to the conclusion that the uh, answer to that question is yes. Perhaps the most prominent work is Tom Tyler's um, uh, book, uh, Why People Obey the Law. But if you look carefully at much of this literature, most especially Tyler's work, you discover a very important confusion. A confusion between um, compliance with the law because it is the law and engaging in action for other reasons that happens to be consistent with the law. You don't have to believe me when I make this claim, but I do not engage in murder. I do not engage in theft. I do not engage in rape. I do not even engage in insider trading. There are laws against all of these activities, and therefore, uh, in some sense, I am in compliance with all of these laws. But if all of these laws were repealed, my behavior would not change at all. My behavior is consistent with the law, but the law is not a causal influence in determining what I do or what I don't do in these kinds of instances. Here we come back to Hart. Hart disagrees. In an important passage at about page 40 of the concept of law, Hart introduces the figure of the puzzled man. He uses the phrase in contrast to uh, Holmes's idea of the bad man, and Hart describes the puzzled man uh, as the person who wants to uh, follow the law if only he can know what it is. It's not, Hart says, what Holmes thought. It's not what Austin thought. There are actually puzzled people out there who would like to obey the law just because it is the law, without regard to force, without regard to threats, without regard to sanctions. <laughs> 
And indeed, importantly, Hart criticizes Austin's account, Austin's neglect of the puzzled man uh, as not fitting the facts. So Hart and more, even more obviously, Shapiro more recently are making an empirical claim that there are, in fact, puzzled people in just this sense in significant numbers. That is, there are people out there uh, who want to obey the law just because it is the law and without regard to sanctions. But if we are interested in law, as I suspect most of us in this room are, if we are interested in law as law, we want to know what effect law as law has on people's behavior. And therefore, we are let we, uh, or at least I, am less interested in law when it turns out not to be causally important, as in the examples I mentioned earlier. So um, we do know from a considerable amount of empirical research, largely by social psychologists over the last 20 or 30 years, that people frequently act altruistically. Or, as the psychologists sometimes put it, they have pro-social motivations. Uh, they often do the right thing and want to do the right thing, even at some personal cost, even at some sacrifice to themselves. So now we can reformulate the question, once we understand that there are such people out there. We reformulate the question and say, once people have decided what to do, when, once people have, decide, have made a decision or decided on a course of action, a course of action that includes the self-interested but also includes the altruistic and the pro-social, once people have decided what they want to do, all things other than the law considered, and then when the law comes in and says, you have decided what you want to do, all things other than the law considered, but the law says you ought to do something else. Now we've isolated the question. When the law says that people should do things other than their own, all things considered uh, decisions uh, tells them to do, and when there are no sanctions, no threats, and no force. The empirical question is, how often do people then, just because of non-coercive law, put aside their all things considered judgments in favor of the law's judgments? when there are no sanctions and when the law's judgment is different from their own judgment? And the answer to that question turns out to be, on the basis uh, of the literature out there, not much. Not, not at all, but not much. Um, so um, I spend, uh, I'm in, I've been interested in this question for some years. Uh, I am not a trained empiricist, although in a minute I'm going to talk about some um, research findings that come uh, from trained empiricists. I am not a trained empiricist. Uh, my own empirical work on this question, given that I travel a lot, involves um, lurking around um, street corners late in the evening and seeing what people do when there are no police officers and no cars in sight and they see a don't walk sign. So it turns out that at one end of the poll we have the Finns. Uh, in Finland, uh, even late at night, uh, even if there are no police officers around, even if there is no possibility of danger and no possibility of apprehension, the Finns will, by and large, stand obediently at the street corner, waiting until the sign shifts from don't walk to walk. <laughs> 
The other end of the spectrum, um, we have a place where I've lived, where I lived for almost half my life, Cambridge, Massachusetts. If any of you have been in uh, Boston or Harvard Square, more particularly, um, the uh, the relationship between the "Don't Walk" sign and pedestrian behavior is essentially spurious. Uh, and uh, most uh, other places in the world come in between. But I mention the Finns here just to at least acknowledge what I am talking about. That is, um, the what we are tr looking for is, <coughs> excuse me, one minute, behavior in which people's own judgment says cross the street, for example. The law says something else, and they put aside their own judgment in favor of the laws, even without the threat of sanctions. But the Finns, it turns out, are exceptions. There has been some experimental work on this done um, by um, some number of social psychologists uh, in which they, with the appropriate manipulations and the technical sense of manipulation, uh, try to determine what people would do without regard to the law. Then they add law to it um, and then see whether things are actually different. Uh, some of this work has been done by Nick, Nicholas Schweitzer uh, at Arizona State University. Some of it has been done by some number um, of other people, some researchers at Carnegie Mellon University in the US. Uh, the experimental research suggests that uh, people's first order substantive preferences, in particular their first order substantive policy preferences, overwhelm any view that the law ought to be followed. Uh, that when there is a divergence between people's policy preferences and what the law says, they will go with their policy preferences and not with what the law says. Fair amount of empirical research, um, uh, non-experimental, supports the same idea. Um, uh, some of it um, looks uh, throughout the world at various different forms of regulatory behavior. Um, so it turns out um, that uh, in a number of different U.S. cities, uh, the compliance rate for uh, dog licenses, which are required, is about 10 percent. The compliance rate for cat licenses is about 2 percent. Under circumstances of more or less voluntary tax compliance, tax payments turn out to be extremely low when there's no possibility of uh, or direct monitoring. Uh, a study done on sales to minors of cigarettes in Hong Kong um, uh, demonstrates once again very low compliance rates uh, without uh, threat of force. Similarly in Jamaica with motorcycle helmet laws uh, and in a number of places in the world um, uh, including uh, Los Angeles and Australia. Studies have been done uh, both about high occupancy vehicle lanes and honor systems on the metro or mass transit. Um, essentially, honor systems don't work. Uh, there are various forms of threats, there are various forms uh, of coercion, uh, but honor systems have been found not to work. Uh, if there is a lesson that comes out of the existing empirical research um, is that um, coercion and sanctions turn out to be, as Hart identified, a natural necessity for law to do what it, what it is supposed to do. By and large, again, uh, natural necessity is not universal. For law to do what it is supposed to do, um, it turns out that a belief that one should follow the law just because it is the law, Hart's puzzled man, turns out to be empirically uh, misguided. 
Uh, there are few puzzled people in heart's sense in the world. Uh, and if there are few puzzled people in heart's sense um, in the world, then it turns out um, that coercion, force, sanctions, and threats come back into the picture to enable law to do what it has to do. Now, under those circumstances, one of the reasons that law wants to do what it has to do under those circumstances is that people's all things considered uh, other than the law judgment often turns out to be wrong. One is the phenomenon of overconfidence. People uh, uh, tend to be overconfident in their own judgment, uh, and therefore um, the law has a role to play in tempering people's overconfidence about their own decision-making abilities. It also turns out that people often, uh, uh, as part of their overconfidence, uh, even if they are entirely altruistic and well-meaning, um, are uh, knowledge deficient or ignorant. A good example of this, uh, and there have been some studies on this, um, uh, comes up in the following situation. So suppose that you are out uh, driving in your car uh, that may uh, describe a smaller number of people in Singapore than it describes in other places in the world, but suppose that you are uh, out there driving in your car uh, and up ahead of you, you see that there has been a motorcycle accident. The motorcycle rider is riding, is lying in the motorway um, with cars approaching. You are a good altruistic person and because you are a good altruistic person, you stop your car and your instinct is to move the, the injured rider out of the path of oncoming cars, even if in doing so you will subject yourself to some danger. And in fact, there is indication that lots of people will do exactly that. But they shouldn't. That is, it turns out that in those circumstances, the likelihood of the injured rider being further injured, especially with a spinal cord injury by being moved, is greater than the likelihood that that person will be hit by an oncoming vehicle. Good, well-meaning people, good, altruist, altruistic people often get it wrong. And that's even apart from the prisoner's dilemma kinds of problems um, where, again, uh, law may have um, a particular role to play or coercion may have a particular role to play um, in um, moving people away from their own, all things other than the law, considered judgments. All of this is to say, as Bentham said, as Austin said, as Kelsen said, that if we want to describe this in generic terms, law is a coercive order. One can say, again, following uh, the idea of generics and Sarah Jane Leslie's understanding of the idea of generics, uh, we can understand why law is coercive in the same way that we can say that Volvos are reliable. Now, there's a lot more to be said and done about all of this. Uh, one thing uh, that needs to be thought about that I want to do more thinking about is what's the role of the state in all of this? Uh, there are dimensions of coercion where the state is organizing private coercion, but more broadly, what's the role of the state, what's the role of government in understanding the idea of law? After all, in Hart's terms, there are institutions or organizations out there that have primary rules, secondary rules, a union of primary and secondary rules, and have officials at the top who have internalized, in exactly Hart's sense, uh, the ultimate rule of recognition. Among those organizations are the Mafia, the Football Association, 
the American Contract Bridge League, uh, and many, many others. And one thing that a full account um, of the role of coercion in law, or maybe even the role of law uh, in general, uh, about which much more needs to be said, is what's the relationship between law and the political state. Uh, if we assume it's too close, we may ignore the important law-like dimensions of the mafia and the football association, even though there may be ways in which they are non-law-like. Much more also needs to be said um, about the forms of coercion. So both Bentham and Austin were dismissive about rewards. Both of them said, I am concerned uh, only about the negative and not about the positive. There may be a reason for that. That is the state in Bentham's time, the state uh, a few years later in Austin's time, didn't have very much to give. That is, for Bentham and for Austin, they lived in a world uh, that was largely devoid of government employment, government pensions, government health care, uh, government housing, and various other forms of state-provided benefits. And as a result, for them, rewards didn't play very much of a role. Bentham did recognize a broader idea than just punishment or threats of negative sanctions. What he talked about at times, and I think it is basically right, is uh, coercion uh, or force or sanctions in terms of the law adjusting people's motivations. And if we think about the adjustment of motivations in modern terms, it's clear that that can come by virtue of rewards or positive incentives as much, even if not more, uh, by negative incentives. And finally, let me just finish with uh, another avenue that all of this might lead into, one that I call the differentiation of law if we ask the question, why are we interested in a theory of law? Why are we interested in trying to locate the nature of law? At least one answer to that question is we want to try to figure out how law is different from other governmental institutions, from other decision-making institutions, uh, from other behavior-controlling institutions. And we are led, therefore, into an agenda that I call the differentiation of law. Uh, the term comes from Niklas Luhmann, uh, who operates in a decidedly different tradition from mine. Um, but if we are looking to, uh, to identify the differentiation of law, we might want to investigate, as Luhmann did, the sociological differentiation. After all, for most people um, who are uh, lawyers or who teach law, a surprising number of our uh, friends, acquaintances, and contacts are other lawyers. We exist in a sociologically differentiated world. Much of classic legal theory thinks not in terms of sociological differentiation, but source-based differentiation. That is, uh, at, the, uh, at the core of the idea of the rule of recognition, is that the rule of recognition recognizes some uh, things as law, some sources as law, and recognizes other sources as non-law. And at least in the rule of recognition tradition, source-based differentiation may be the key to understanding how law is different from other um, decision-making institutions. We can also examine procedural differentiation. Law is procedurally different from other forms of decision-making, other forms of judgment. After all, uh, the modal number of parties in a legal decision is two. However much it may be some uh, different or larger number in policy-making more generally, 
various other aspects of legal decision making are quite different from policy making in general, including the uh, requirements of what in my country are, uh, are called procedural due process and in much of the rest of the common law world is called natural justice, uh, the requirements of notice and hearing, the requirements of an impartial decision maker, uh, and so on. Um, uh, the requirement of giving reasons. Uh, in many respects, law is procedurally differentiated from other institutions. How can we think about this? How can we theorize about this? And finally, we can, there is what we can call methodological differentiation. Do lawyers think differently from other people? Are there forms of legal reasoning and legal argument and legal decision making that are different from those that uh, exist in other decision making domains? Lord Cook, a few hundred years ago, or more than a few hundred years ago, um, talked about the artificial reason of the law. Is the artificial reason of the law something genuine? Is it something important in differentiating legal thinking and therefore legal decision making from other things? Okay, I will leave it at that. These last final thoughts departed a fair amount from coercion. Uh, uh, there are things I hint at towards the end of this book, but at least for me, uh, they are part of what uh, a comprehensive look into the nature of law ought to look at, which in part I hope to look at in the future. Okay, I'll stop at that. Uh, I'll turn it over to you uh, to call on people or do whatever happens now. Okay, thanks very much.